Chapter Six of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Two, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six: That the Son is not inferior to the Father either in power or in operation for any work, but is equal in might and consubstantial with Him, as of Him and that by nature. Nineteen jesus therefore answered and said unto them verily verily i say unto you the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do for what things soever he doeth these doeth also the son likewise what we have spoken of above this again he interprets in another way from all quarters snaring the hearers unto finding of the truth for the word which was not received at first by reason of the weakness of them that could not understand he reforms in another way and going through the same thoughts introduceth it manifoldly for this too is the work of the virtue that befits a teacher namely not to make his word rapid and speeding beyond the knowledge of the pupils but carefully wrought and diversely fashioned and that by frequent change of expression strips off the difficulties in the things under consideration mingling then human with divine and forming one discourse of both he as it were gently sinks the honour befitting the only begotten and raises the nature of man as being at once lord and reckoned among servants he says the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do for what things soever he doeth these doeth also the son likewise for in that he is able to do without distinction the works of god the father and to work alike with him that begat him he testifieth the identity of his essence for things which have the same nature with one another will work alike but those whose mode of being is diverse their mode of working too will be in all respects not the same therefore as very god a very god the father he says that he can do these things equally with him but that he may appear not only equal in power to the father but like-minded in all things and having in all things the will one with him he saith that he can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do just as though he should say distinctly to those who are trying to persecute him for healing a man on the sabbath day ye deem the honour of the sabbath broken but i would not have done this had i not seen my father do the like for he worketh for the good order of the world on the sabbath too even though through me it is then impossible saith he that i the son of him by nature should not wholly in all things work and will the works of the father not as though i received from without by being taught the exemplar of action or were called by a deliberate motion to will the same with the father but by the laws of uncreated nature i mount up to equal counsel and action with god the father for the being able to do nothing of himself is excellently well defined herein and thus i deem that piously minded we ought to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of christ as it is written but perchance the opposer of the truth will disbelieve and will make what is said the food so to say of his own ill counsel saying if the son were equal to the father attributing to him no pre-eminence as of necessity by reason of the inferiority of his own nature what induced him so unconcealedly to say that he could do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do for clearly saith he does he herein confess that he can do nothing at all of himself as knowing him that is the better and superior to himself but do thou again refute our argument what then is to be said to these things by us bold unto blasphemy is the enemy of christ and drunken with folly he perceives it not 
for one must most excellent sir test accurately the force of what has been said and not dash off hand to reasoning springing from unlearning for to what kind of equality with the father dost thou deem it right to bring down the son by reason of his saying that he can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do is it as not having equality and power that he says these things although from the very passage under consideration one may see that the son is equal in power with the father rather than inferior in god befitting might for plainly he does not say the son can do nothing of himself except he receive power of the father for this would be the part of one really weak but but what he seeth the father do but that by the sense of seeing we are not usually called to be powerful but to look at something i suppose no one will dispute the son then in saying that he looketh on the works of his father doth not show himself impotent but rather a zealous imitator or beholder and how shall be more accurately spoken of in what follows but that through his exact and likest working i mean in all things he is shown to have equality in power himself will clearly teach below adding as of his father for what things soever he doeth these saith he doeth also the son likewise how then is he inferior who is eminent in equal workings with god the father for will the offspring of fire work aught different from fire any change being seen in its work how could it be so how then will the son work in like manner with the father if by reason of having inferiority he comes short of equal might with him and these things were taken from the words at present under comment but let us consider going through other considerations also whether the nature of the son admits any law of inferiority to that of the father let the consideration of power also be before us do they confess that the son is god of god by nature and verily and of the actual essence of the father or do they say indeed that he is god but blasphemously add that he is outside the essence of the father if then they say that he is not of the essence of the father he will neither be god by nature nor very son for that which is not of god by nature neither ought it at all to be conceived of as by nature god nor yet son if it be not begotten of the essence of the father but they are bringing in privily to us some bastard and new god if they do not say this blushing at the absurdity that is in their own doctrines but will grant that the only begotten is truly of the father and is god by nature and verily how will he be inferior to the father or how powerless to aught and this not accuse the essence of him who begat him for if it be possible that he who is by nature god should at all be impotent what is to hinder the father from being in the same case if the divine and ineffable nature once has the power of being so and is already so manifested in the son according to their account hence then neither will the divinity be impassable nor will it remain in sameness and bliss wholly unchangeable but who tell me will endure them that hold such opinions who when the scripture crieth aloud that the son is the lord of hosts will not shudder to say that he must needs be strengthened and is imperfect in that which of right is his alone with the father and holy ghost but our opponent will say again we say that the father surpasses the son in this for the one is the first beginner of works as having perfection both in power and in the knowledge of all things but the son becomes first a spectator then a worker by receiving into himself the imitation of the father's working in order that through the similarity of works he too might be thought to be god for this he teacheth us 
saying that he can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do what art thou saying thou all daring doth the son receive into himself the types of the father's working that thereby he may be thought to be god by learning then will he be god not by nature as in us is it may be knowledge and art so is in him the dignity and he is rather an artificer of the works of deity than very god yet is he i suppose altogether other than the art that is in him though it be god befitting him then that has passed forth of the boundaries of the godhead and has his glory in the art alone how do angels in heaven worship him we too worship without blame albeit the holy scripture admonisheth us that we ought not to serve any apart from him who is truly god for it says thou shalt worship the lord thy god and him only shalt thou serve yet the holy multitude of angels in particular erred not from what is befitting but they worship the son and serve him with us acknowledging him to be god by nature and not by learning as those babbling say for they perceive not it seems into how great absurdities they will thence fall for in the first place the son will admit change and variation as from the less to the greater albeit himself saith through the prophet behold behold i am and change not the psalmist too will surely lie in the spirit crying out to the son but thou art the same for he awaiteth as those say the father's working at something as a guide and teacher that he may see and imitate then how will not such an one appear to mount up from ignorance of certain things unto knowledge thereof and to turn from worse to better if we reckon that knowledge of anything good is better than not knowing it next what additional absurdity is herein beheld let them tell us who introduce god as an instructor rather than a father doth the son await the sight of his father's works in ignorance of them or having most perfect knowledge of them if then they say that he awaits though he knows them they clearly show that he is doing something very superfluous and the father practising a most idle thing for the one as though ignorant looks at what he knows perfectly the other attempts to teach one who knows and to whom is it not evident that such things incur the charge of the extremest absurdity but perchance they will not say this but will go over to the opposite alternative for they will affirm that he awaiteth of necessity the father working in order to learn by seeing how then doth he know all things before they were or how will he be true saying of himself am i a god at hand saith the lord and not a god afar off shall aught be hidden from me but how is it not absurd and unlearned to believe that the spirit searcheth and knoweth the deep things of god and to suppose that the giver of the spirit is in ignorance of the works of the father and of his own spirit so as to come short in knowledge for will not the son at length lose his being wisdom if he be wholly ignorant and receive by learning for he will be a recipient of wisdom rather than wisdom itself by nature for wisdom is that which maketh wise not that which is formed to become wise just as light too is that which enlighteneth not that which is formed to receive light therefore is he again other than the wisdom which is in him and in the first place he is not simple but compounded of two next besides this he will also lose the being god i mean god by nature and essentially for the divine nature endureth not the being taught by any at all nor the duplication of composition seeing it hath as its proper good the being both simple and all perfection 
and if the son be not god by nature how doth he both work and do things befitting god alone will they say that it suffices for him unto god befitting power only to see the father working and by the mere sight does he attain to being by nature god and to being able to do such things as he that showeth him doth there is therefore nothing to hinder but that many others too should be manifested to us as gods if the father be willing to show them too the mode of his works and the excellence of the father's essence will consist in learning something over and above for he that was taught as those say is found to have mounted up to the dignity of the godhead by nature saying i and my father are one he that hath seen me hath seen the father let them weigh then how great a crowd of blasphemies is heaped up by them from their choosing so to think and let them think truly of the son as it is written for neither by contemplation of what is performed by the father nor yet by having him as antecedent to himself in actions is the son a doer or wonder-worker and by reason hereof god but because a certain law of nature carries him to the exact likeness of him who begat him even though it shine forth and is manifested through the unceasing likeness of their works but setting before us again if you please the verse and testing it with more diligent scrutiny let us consider accurately what is the force of the words and let us now see how we must think with piety therefore verily verily i say unto you the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do for what things soever he doeth these doeth also the son likewise thou seest how through the exact likeness too in the works he showeth himself like in all things to the father that thereby he may be shown to be heir of his essence also for in that he must of necessity and incontrovertibly be conceived of as being god by nature who hath equal working with god the father the saviour says thus but let no one be offended when he says economical that he can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do for in that he was now arrayed in the form of the servant and made man by being united to flesh he did not make his discourse free nor altogether let loose unto god befitting boldness but used rather at times by an economy such discourse as befits alike god and man for he was really both in the same and this is one true word but i think one ought again to explain what is before us in another way too and to apply more keenly to the accurate meaning of the passage the son it says can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do the word cannot or impossibility is predicated of certain things or is applied to certain of things that are for this being predicated we say is not indicative at all of necessity nor of weakness but often denotes the stability of natures and the immovable condition of essences in respect of what each thing mentioned either is or has been and of what it can effect by nature and without change but let our argument if you please go through demonstration also when for instance a man says that he cannot carry a piece of wood immeasurable perhaps and heavy he predicates his innate weakness but when another says i being by nature a reasonable man and born of a father by nature reasonable cannot do anything my own and of myself which i do not see belonging to the nature of my parent the words i cannot express the stability of essence and its inability to change into anything but what it is for says he i cannot of myself be not a reasonable creature strengthened by increases accruing to me by nature for i do not see the power of doing this in the nature of my father 
in this way then you may hear christ saying the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do for do not saith he blame the works of the son for he beholding as in his proper thoughts or natural motions the essence of him that begat him what things he seeth that nature befittingly work these he doeth and none other not being able to suffer aught contrary to his nature by reason of his being of it thus the nature of the father hath the will to compassionate the son seeing this inherent therein is compassionate as being of him by nature not being able to be other than what it is for he hath of the father as essence so the good things too of the essence simply that is an uncompound as god therefore he wisely subjoins to the former words for what things soever he doeth these doeth also the son likewise in these words collecting so to say the whole meaning of his being able to do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do but by considering the cause why the son says these things you will apply your mind more accurately to the thing spoken by us when then he on the sabbath day was compassionating the paralytic the jews began trying to persecute him but christ shames them showing that god the father hath mercy on the sabbath day for he did not think he ought to hinder what things were tending to our salvation and indeed he said at the beginning my father worketh hitherto and i work but when they of their great ill counsel showed that they were vexed at these things he subjoins again the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do for what things soever he doeth these doeth also the son likewise for since saith he the father refuseth not to have mercy on the sabbath day i seeing that he is altogether full of compassion am therefore myself too wholly compassionate not able to cut out anew in myself the essence of my father through not appearing and being such as he is by nature for i wholly work what is his as being of him but the saying that the father is antecedent in the work is not free from the deepest unlearning for how should he ever of himself and alone begin who has the son as the operative power for all things eternally with him the exponent of his will as to aught and of his motion to operation in respect of aught but if they uninstructedly assert that he awaits the separate operation of the father for each several work in order to imitate equally let them show us that the father wrought anything separately and of himself or with paralytic he having first healed hath given the deed as a pattern to his son twenty for the father loveth the son those who were heedlessly blaspheming against him by reason of the sabbath christ convicts of being foolishly exasperated to empty anger making the most clear proof of the matter by saying that he is loved by his father for if the father wholly loveth the son it is plain that he loves him not as grieving him but rather as gladdening him in what he does and works vainly then do they persecute him who refuseth not to show mercy on the sabbath and hereby again are they found opposing the decrees of god the father for they think they ought to hate him whom he loves but it is altogether i suppose manifest that he would never have loved him if he had gone contrary to the will of his father and been accustomed to do of himself and alone whatsoever himself willed but since he justly loves he approves it is plain and agrees to the breaking of the sabbath and shows that it has nothing in respect of which god the lord of the law might reasonably be angry and showeth him all things that himself doeth needs does he subjoin this too to the preceding and wherefore i will say 
fathers who are among us sometimes overcome by natural affection bear with their sons grieving them and seeing them attempt things against their judgment they often suffer it for vehement is the yearning love implanted in them in respect of their children persuading them to overcome all littleness of soul towards them but not thus saith he does god the father love the son for he cannot do anything which he too does not work by nature but as having one essence with him he is called by certain physical laws so to say to identical will and power the son then saith he worketh nothing contrary to what is pleasing or fitting to the father nor does he vaunt himself in the love of the father as though a lover of novelty in his works and unbridled but whatsoever things he sees him doing as in conception all these he performeth restrained by identity of essence from falling aside in aught that is befitting god for he hath no part with change in aught or variableness for he remaineth the same unceasingly as the psalmist says the father again showeth the son what he himself doeth not as though setting before him things depicted on a tablet or teaching him as though ignorant for he knoweth all things as god but depicting himself wholly in the nature of his offspring and showing in him his own natural properties in order that from what properties himself is and is manifested he may know of what kind and who he is by nature that begat him therefore christ says that no man knoweth who the son is but the father and who the father is but the son for the accurate knowledge of each is in both not by learning but by nature and god the father seeth the son in himself the son again seeth the father in himself therefore he saith i am in the father and the father in me but to see and to be seen must here be conceived of after a divine sort and greater works than these will he show him that ye may marvel above the blessed evangelist says the jews were seeking to kill jesus because he was not only breaking the sabbath but saying also that god was his father making himself equal with god he therefore put down the accusation respecting the sabbath by showing that the father himself worked on the sabbath day and expending many words thereupon and endeavours to teach them that he is in equality with the father even when made man for our sakes for this was what the argument yet lacked and therefore does he say and greater works than these will he show him that ye may marvel and what again does he will to show us hereby the paralytic it says has been healed which had an infirmity thirty and eight years and marvellous indeed the power of him that healed him god befitting exceedingly the authority this so great wonder-worker no one i suppose in his senses would blame for saying that he is god and since he is son equal in all things to him that begat him but since ye he says imagining things most wicked and foolish are offended because of this mortal body ye must needs learn that my authority and power stop not here for ye shall be even though ye will it not spectators of greater wonders to wit of the resurrection of the dead and yet more shall ye be astonished seeing power and glory befitting god in me whom now ye charge with blasphemy and are not ashamed to persecute for merely saying i am the son of god but how god the father shows his works to the son we have already said at much length twenty one for as the father raiseth the dead and quickeneth them so the son too quickeneth whom he will see again in these words clear proof of his equality for he that worketh equally in respect of the reviving of the dead how can he have inferiority in aught 
or how shall he be of another nature and alien to the father who is radiant with the same properties for the power of quickening which is in the father alike and the son is a property of the divine essence but the father doth not again separately and of himself quicken some the son some separately and apart for the son having in himself by nature the father the father doth all things and worketh all things through the son but since the father hath the power of quickening in his own nature as also himself too he attributes the power of quickening the dead as though accruing to each separately End of chapter 6chapter seven of commentary on the gospel of john book two by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven that naught of god befitting dignities or excellences is in the son by participation or from without twenty two for neither doth the father judge any man but hath committed all judgment unto the son he introduceth another god befitting and marvellous thing in many ways persuading them that he is god by nature and verily for to what other would it be fit to judge the world save him alone who is god over all whom too the divine scriptures call to this saying in one place arise o god judge the earth in another again for god is the judge he putteth down one and setteth up another but he says that judgment has been given him by the father not as being without authority hereto but economically as man teaching that all things are more suitably referred to the divine nature whereto himself too being not external in that he is word and god hath inherently authority over all but in that he is made man to whom it is said what hast thou that thou didst not receive he fittingly acknowledges that he received it to these things again one of our opponents will say lo the son evidently declares that he hath received judgment of the father but he receives it is plain as not having how then will not he that gives with authority be greater and of superior nature to him who must needs receive what then do we say to these things our prearranged argument has been i think not unskilfully managed introducing a consideration specially befitting the time to wit of the incarnation and most accordant with the economy of the flesh when he was called a servant when he humbled himself made in our likeness but since it seemeth good to thee haughtily to despise the simpler doctrines and to make more critical examination of them come then opposing thy objections let us first say not altogether nor of necessity sir doth he that is said to give anything impart it to the recipient as though he had it not nor yet is the giver always greater than the receiver for what wilt thou do when thou seest the holy psalmist saying in the spirit give glory to god shall we consider that god is in need of glory or that we who are commanded to offer him this are on this account greater than the creator but not even thou wilt dare to say this who shunnest not the fear of blasphemies for full of glory is the godhead even though it receive it not from us for he who receives as honour what he hath of his own will never be thought inferior to those who offer him glory as a gift one may often see that he who has received anything is not inferior to the giver and that the father is not therefore of superior nature to his offspring because he hath committed to him all judgment next we must consider this too to judge or to give judgment are rather operations and acts conceived as properties of essences than themselves truly essences 
for we in giving judgment do something being in ourselves what we are but if we grant that judging or giving judgment is of the nature of an essence how must we not needs grant even against our wills that some cannot exist at all except as judges and that their being wholly ceases together with the termination of the judgment but so to think is most absurd judgment then is an operation and nothing else what then hath the father committed to the son no accession from his own nature in committing all judgment to him but rather an operation in respect of them that are judged how then will he herein be greater or of superior nature by having added anything which was not in the son who saith all things that the father hath are mine how then he must be conceived of as giving here now as god the father having the power to create createth all things through the son as through his own power and might so having the power too to judge he will work this too through the son as his own righteousness as though it were said that fire too yielded up burning to the operation that is of itself by nature the fact taking this direction so piously interpreting hath committed shall we escape the snare of the devil but if they persist in shamelessly asserting that glory is added to him of the father through his being manifested judge of the earth let them teach us how he is any longer to be considered lord of glory who in the last times was crowned with the honours hereunto pertaining End of chapter 7chapter eight of commentary on the gospel of john book two by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight that the son being god and of god by nature and the exact image of him who begat him hath equal honour and glory with him twenty three that all should honour the son even as they honour the father he that honoureth not the son honoureth not the father which sent him a cause and reason of the things already enumerated is now evident that is to say that the son ought to be honoured in equality and likeness with the father for recapitulating a little and carried back to a recollection of the preceding you will view accurately the force of the passage he said then that god was his father making himself equal with god then again he began showing that he was of equal strength and skill saying for what things soever he doeth these doeth also the son likewise that he is both life and life-giving by nature as is he too who begat him he showed plainly adding for as the father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them so the son too quickeneth whom he will but that he will be also judge of all the father in all things co-approving and consenting he declared saying for neither doth the father judge any man but hath committed all judgment unto the son what then is the cause of these things what induced the only begotten to say all this that all men he saith should honour the son even as they honour the father for if he hath all things whatever the father hath as far as pertains to god befitting dignity how is it not fitting that he to whom nothing is lacking to identity of essence should be crowned with equal honours with him what then do they say to this too who pervert all equity as saith the prophet isaiah if he says by reason of its being said that all men should honour the son even as they honour the father ye suppose that one ought to magnify the son with equal honours with the father ye know not that ye are stepping far away from the truth for the word as does not altogether introduce equality of acts in respect of those things it is affixed to but often marks out a kind of likeness just as he says the saviour counsels saying be ye therefore merciful as your father also which is in heaven is merciful 
shall we then be as merciful as the father on account of the as and again christ says to his father of the disciples thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me but we will not grant that the disciples are loved just as the son on account of the as why then dost thou multiply words and distort what is said into blasphemy though it introduces no obligation on the hearers to honour the son in equal measure with the father what then is our answer to these things with bitter words do the fighters against god bay at us but without are dogs as paul saith without are evil workers without the right faith or the concision for we are sons of the truth and children of the light therefore we will glorify the only begotten together with god the father not with any difference but in equality of honour and glory as god of god and light of light and life of life and over much inquiry into what is to be received as faith is not without hazard nevertheless we must test the force of the as lest our opponents be overwise in their own conceits when therefore as is applied to things unlike in their nature it does not wholly introduce absolute equality but rather likeness and resemblance as ye yourselves acknowledged above but when it is applied to things in all respect like to one another it shows equality in all things and similitude and whatever else is found to have the same force with these just as if i say bright is the sun in heaven bright too is silver which is of the earth yet is the nature of the things mentioned diverse let any of the rich of the earth be supposed to say to his household servants let the silver shine as the sun in this case we very justly say that earthly matter attains not to equal brightness with the sun but to a certain likeness and resemblance although the word as be used of it but let peter and john suppose of the holy disciples be brought forward who both in respect of nature and of piety towards god fail not of an accurate likeness one to another let the as be applied some one saying of them as here let john be honoured by all even as peter will the as here be powerless so that equal honour ought not to be paid to both but i do not suppose that any one will say such a thing for he will see that there is nothing to prevent it according to this analogy of idea when the as is applied to the father and the son why should we shrink from crowning both with equal honours for he having considered before as god things to come and having carefully viewed the envious opposition of thine unlearning hath brought in the as not bare and bereft of the aid befitting it but having strengthened it beforehand with convenient proofs and shown afore that he is god by nature for he made god his father having again foreshown that he is both god the creator and of a truth life and having before introduced himself altogether glorying so to say in the attributes of god the father he afterwards seasonably subjoins that all men should honour the son even as they honour the father too then what objection still appears what is there to hinder that he in whom are essentially the properties and excellencies of the father should attain to an equal degree of honour for we shall be found honouring the very nature of god the father full well beaming forth in the son wherefore he proceeds he that honoureth not the son honoureth not the father which sent him for the charge of dishonouring the son and the force of blasphemy against him will mount up unto none other more truly than the father himself who put forth the son as it were from the fount of his own nature even though he be seen throughout the whole holy scriptures as everlastingly with him yea saith the opponent 
let the charge from dishonouring the son go to whatsoever you please or rather let it reach even unto god the father himself for he will be angry and that with reason yet not wholly so as though his very nature were insulted in the son according to our just now carefully finished argument but since he is his image and impress formed most excellently after his divine and ineffable essence he is with reason angry and will wholly transfer the wrong to himself for it were indeed most absurd that he who insulted the divine impresses should not surely pay the penalty of his sin against the archetype just as he who has insuited the images of earthly kings is punished as having indeed transgressed against the ruler himself and in like manner shall we find it decreed by god in respect of ourselves also for whoso saith he sheddeth man's blood for his blood shall he be poured forth because in the image of god he made man seest thou then hereby very clearly saith he that if the image be wronged and not altogether the divine nature god the father deems it right to be angry in this way then let that which is said by christ be conceived of and adapted he that honoureth not the son neither doth he honour the father shall then the only begotten be classed with us as external to the essence of the father how then will he yet be god by nature if he altogether slip out of the bounds of the godhead situate in some nature of his own and of other sort than that wherein the father is and we do wrong it seems in bringing into one count of godhead the order of the holy trinity we ought we ought at length to worship the father as god to impart some glory of their own to the son and the spirit severing them as it were into different natures and defining severally to each the mode of his existence yet do the divine scriptures declare unto us one god classing with the father the son and the spirit so that through their essential and exact sameness the holy trinity is brought unto one count of godhead the only begotten is not then alien from the nature of him who begat him but neither will he be a wit conceived of as son in truth if he beamed not forth from the essence of the father for this and no other is the definition and mode of true sonship in all but if there be no son god's being father will be wholly taken away too how then will paul be true in saying of him of whom every family in heaven and earth is named for if he have not begotten of himself in god-befitting manner the son how shall the beginning of fatherhood be in him going through an imitation to those who are in heaven and earth but god is in truth father the only begotten therefore is by nature son and is of a surety within the bounds of the divinity for god will be begotten of god even as man for example of man and the nature of god the father which transcends all things will not err by bearing fruit not befitting it but since some blasphemously and foolishly say that it is not the nature of god the father that is insulted in the son when he does not receive due honour from any but that he is angry reasonably and rightly at his own image being dishonoured in him we must ask them in what sense they would have the son be and be called the image of the father yea rather let us for stalling their account determine beforehand the nature of the image according to legitimate reasoning for so will the result of our inquiries be clear and more distinct therefore one and the first mode of image is that of sameness of natures and properties exactly alike as abel of adam or isaac of abraham the second again is that consisting in likeness of impress and accurate impression of form as the king's delineation in wood or made in any other way most excellently and skilfully as respects him 
another image again is taken in respect of habits and manners and conversation and inclination to either good or bad as for instance it may be said that the well-doer is like paul him that is not so like cain for the being equally good or bad works likeness with either and with reason confers it another form of image is that of dignity and honour and glory and excellence as when one for instance succeeds another in command and does all things with the authority which belongs to and becomes him an image in another sense is in respect of any either quality or quantity of a thing and its outline and proportion for we must speak briefly let then the most critical investigators of the divine image teach us whether they think one ought to attribute to the only begotten the essential and natural likeness and thus say that the only begotten word proceeding from the father is an image of him in the same sense as abel is of adam who retained in himself the whole nature of his parent and bore the count of human nature all complete or will they be vexed at this compelled to confess the son truly god of god by nature and turning aside according to their custom to fight against the truth advance to the second kind of image which is conceived to exist in mere form impress and outline but i suppose they will shrink from saying this for no one even if he be a very praetor will suppose that the godhead can be estimated in respect of size or circumscribed by outline or meted by impress or that the unembodied will wholly undergo what belongs to bodies do they say then that he is conformed to him in respect of manners and habits and will and are they not ashamed to dress him in this image for how is he yet to be conceived of as god by nature who has likeness to him in will only but has another being separately of himself for they will surely acknowledge that he subsists then what is there in him more than in the creature for shall we not believe that the angels themselves hasten to perform the divine will who are by nature other than god but what when this is conceived of as belonging to us too for does not the only begotten teach us foolishly to jump at things above our nature and to aim at impossibilities saying be ye merciful as your father also which is in heaven is merciful for this were undoubtedly to say that we ought to gain the likeness of the father by identity of will and paul too was an imitator of christ of the as they babbling say image of the father in will only but they will shift their ground i suppose from these miserable conceptions and as though thinking something greater and better will surely say this the only begotten is the image of god the father in respect of identity of will in respect of god befitting dignity and glory and power in respect of operation in creation and working miracles in respect of reigning and ruling over all in respect of judging and being worshipped by angels and men and in short by all creation by all these he showing us the father in himself says that he is not of his person but is the impress of his person therefore as we said just now the son is none of these by nature but is altogether separate from all of them according at least to your most foolish reasoning and is neither very god nor son nor king nor lord nor creator nor mighty nor in respect of his own will is he by nature good but in boast solely and only of what is god befitting is he seen and as is the application of tints to paintings on tablets beautifying them by the variety to the eye but having nothing true so as to the son too the beauty of the excellencies of god the father decks him around with bare names only but is as it were applied from without like certain tints yea rather the divine nature is outlined in him and appears in bare type next 
how will ye not be shown to be fighting outright with all the holy scriptures that ye may with justice hear ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears ye are always resisting the holy ghost as your fathers did so do ye too for when do they not call the son very god or when do they bear him forth from the essence of his father which of them has dared to say that he is by nature neither creator nor king nor almighty nor to be worshipped for the divine psalmist says as to the only begotten himself thy throne o god is for ever and ever thomas again the most wise disciple and likewise calls him god alike and lord he is called almighty and creator by every voice of saint and as having not according to you the dignity from without but as being by nature what he is said to be and therefore is he worshipped both by the holy angels and by us albeit the divine scripture says that we ought to worship none other save the lord god alone if then they hold that the god befitting dignity in him is acquired and given and think that they ought to worship such an one let them know that they are worshipping the creature rather than the creator and making out to themselves a new and fresh god rather than acknowledging him who is really so by nature but if while they say that the son is external to the essence of god the father they yet acknowledge him to be son and very god and king and lord and creator and to have essentially in himself the properties and excellencies of the father let them see whither there is risk that the end of those who thus think will be for nothing at all will be found of sure faith in the divine nature since the nature of things originate also is now capable of being whatever it is conceived to be for it has been proved according to the most feeble reasoning of our opponents that the only begotten not being of the divine nature hath yet truly in himself its excellencies who will not shudder at the mere hearing the blasphemy of the doctrines for all things are now overturned when the nature that is above all things descendeth so as to be classed with things originate and the creation itself contrary to reason springs up to the measure above it and not designed for it therefore let us swimming away from the absurdity of such doctrines as from a ship sinking in the sea hasten to the truth as to a secure and unruffled haven and let us acknowledge the son to be the image of god the father not plastered over so to say with perishable honours nor adorned merely with god befitting titles but essentially exact according to the likeness of his father and unalterably being by nature that which he that begat him is conceived to be to wit very god of god in truth almighty creator glorified good to be worshipped and whatever may be added to the things enumerated as befitting god for then showing him to be like in all things to god the father we shall also show him true in saying that if any will not honour the son neither doth he honour the father which hath sent him for as to this our inquiry and the test of the things just now investigated had its origin twenty four verily verily i say unto you he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and cometh not into condemnation but is passed from death unto life having now proved sufficiently by the foregoing that the miserable jews sin not against the son only by daring to find fault with the things which he says or does among them in his teaching but do also ignorantly transgress against the father himself and having as far as pertains to the force of what has been said wrapped about their overconfidence with fear and persuaded them to live more religiously in hope of things to come he at length snares them to obedience and not unskilfully again did he frame his speech to this end 
for since he knew that the Jews were still diseased, and yet offended concerning him, he again brings back their faith to the person of God the Father, not as excluding himself, but as honored in the Father too, by reason of identity of essence. For he affirms that they who believe shall not only be partakers of eternal life, but also shall escape the peril of the condemnation, being justified, that is, holding forth fear mixed with hope. For thus could he make his discourse more efficacious and more demonstrative to the hearers. 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Having said that believers shall pass from death to life, he introduces himself as performer of the promise, and accomplisher of the whole thing, partly hinting to the Jews that marvellous in truth is the power shown in the case of the paralytic, but that the Son will be revealed as a worker of things yet more glorious, driving away from the bodies of men not only sickness and the infirmities of diseases, but also overthrowing death and the heavily pressing corruption. For this was what was said a little before, The Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and greater works than these will he show him, that ye may marvel. For the greater wonder is shown in the raising of the dead. Partly also preparing the way for that which would probably in no slight degree affright the hearers, for he plainly declares that he will raise the dead, and will bring the creature to judgment, that through the expectation of one day being brought before him, and giving account of everything, they might be found more backward in their daring to persecute him, and might receive more zealously the word of teaching and guidance. To these things, then, the aim of the chapter looks and tends, but we must now explain the words. The common account, then, is, as it seems, that the time will come, when the dead shall hear the voice of him that raiseth them. And they suppose that it is now, too, no less present, either as when Lazarus, for instance, is to hear the voice of the Saviour, or as saying that the dead are those not yet called, through faith, unto eternal life, who will surely attain unto it, by having received the doctrine of the Saviour. And this method of considering it does indeed preserve a plausible appearance, but accuracy not at all. Wherefore, ruminating again the force of the words, we will affix a more suitable sense, and thus open the reading. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. The hour again that is, when they that hear shall live. By the word, then, in the beginning, he means the time of the resurrection, wherein he teaches through the word of the judge that they that sleep shall rise again to answer for their life in the world, that, as I said before, devising the fear thence arising as a bridal, he might persuade them to live full excellently and wisely. By the closing words he shows that the due time of believing is now come, but also says that everlasting life will be the reward of obedience, all but declaring, Ye shall all come to judgment, sirs, that is, at the time of the resurrection. But if it seem bitter to you to be punished, and to undergo endless penalties at the hand of the offended judge, suffer not the time of obedience to pass by, but laying hold of it while yet present, haste ye to attain to everlasting life. 26.27 For as the Father hath life in himself, so gave he to the Son too to have life in himself and gave him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Observe again the economy in these words, that thou mayest marvel at the form of expression, and not, by falling into offence thereat from ignorance, bring upon thyself perdition. For the only begotten, 
being man in respect of the nature of his body and seen as one of us while yet upon the earth with flesh manifoldly instructing the jews in matters pertaining to salvation clothed himself with the glory of two god-befitting things for he clearly affirmed that he would both raise the dead and set them at his judgment seat to be judged but it was extremely likely that the hearers would be vexed at this accusing him with reason because he said that god was his father making himself equal with god having mingled therefore with god befitting authority and splendour language befitting the human nature he beguiles the weight of their wrath saying more modestly and lowlily than was necessary for as the father hath life in himself so hath he given to the son too to have life in himself marvel not saith he if i who am now as you and am seen as a man promise to raise the dead and threaten to bring them to judgment the father hath given me power to quicken he hath given me to judge with authority but when he had hereby healed the readily slipping ear of the jews he bestows zealous care for the profit too of what follows and immediately explaining why he says that he hath received it he alleges that human nature hath nothing of itself saying because he is the son of man for that the only begotten is also life by nature and not a partaker of life from another and so quickeneth as doth the father i think it superfluous to say now since no small discourse was expended hereupon in the beginning of the book upon the words in him was life twenty eight twenty nine marvel not at this for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of doom he signifies by these words the time of the resurrection of all when as the divine paul wrote to us the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a summons with the voice of the archangel with the trump of god to judge the world in righteousness and render to every man according to his works he leads therefore by repetition of the same things the most unlearned understanding of the jews to be able clearly to understand that he will be a worker of greater deeds than those in which the paralytic was concerned and that he will be revealed as a judge of the world and by profitably contrasting the healing of one sick person with the resurrection of the dead he shows that greater and more noteworthy is the operation that undoes death and destroys the corruption of all and reasonably and of necessity says in respect of the lesser miracle marvel not at this and let us not at all suppose that by these words he means to find fault with the glory of his own works or to enjoin the hearers that they ought not to hold worthy of wonder those things whereat one may reasonably wonder but he wishes those who were astonished at that to know and believe that the subject of wonder as yet was small for he raiseth by a word and god befitting operation not only the sick from little diseases but those also who have been already submerged by death and overcome by invincible corruption and hence introducing the greater he says the hour is coming in which all that are in their graves shall hear his voice for he who by a word brought into being things that were not how should he not be able to win back into being that which was already created for thus each will be the effect of the same operation and the glorious production of one authority and profitably does he subjoin that they shall come forth of their graves they that were holden of base deeds and that lived in wickedness to undergo endless punishment the illustrious in virtue to receive the reward of their religiousness eternal life at once as we said above introducing himself as the dispenser of what belongs to each 
in these words of his and persuading them either from fear of suffering dreadful punishments to forego evil and to hasten to elect to live more soberly or pricked with desire after some sort for eternal life make more zealous and eager haste after good End of chapter 8chapter nine of commentary on the gospel of john book two by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine that the son is in nothing inferior to god the father but is of equal might and operation unto all things as god of god thirty i can of mine own self do nothing as i hear i judge and my judgment is just because i seek not mine own will but the will of the father which sent me give more exact heed again to the thing said and receive the force of its thought with intelligence for the jews not knowing the deep mystery of the economy of flesh nor yet acknowledging the word of god indwelling in the temple of the virgin were often excited by zeal, mistaken and not according to knowledge, as Paul saith, to savageness of manners and fierce anger, and indeed were attempting to stone him, for that he, being a man, was making himself God, and again, because he said that God was his father, making himself equal with God but since they were thus hard of understanding and utterly unable to endure god befitting words but both thought and spake meanly of him the saviour by an economy acts the child with them and made his explanation a mixed one neither wholly foregoing words befitting god nor altogether rejecting human language but having said something worthy of his divine authority he forthwith represses the untutored mind of the hearers by bringing in something human also and again having said something human by reason of the economy he suffers not what belongs to him to be seen in mean estate only showing often by his superhuman might and words that he is by nature god some such contrivance will you find now too in the passage at present before us for what did he say before for as the father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them so the son too quickeneth whom he will next again for the hour is coming in the which all that are in their graves shall hear his voice and besides that they shall also come forth to be judged and to receive their reward according to their works but he that saith he can quicken whom he will and in like manner as the father how shall he not be conceived of as clothed with might befitting god he who openly says that he will be judge of all how shall he not with justice terrify those who deem that he is yet bare man for it was like that they being hebrews and instructed in the sacred writings should not be entirely ignorant that god should be judge of the world since they too sang often arise o god judge the earth and again for god is the judge since then he knew that the ignorant people of the jews were vexed at these things he rid them of their accustomed anger by saying in more human language i can of mine own self do nothing as i hear i judge as far then as one can say taking the word superficially he derides the understanding of the jews for the form of expression gives the idea of a sort of weakness and of authority not altogether free but it is not so in truth since the son being equal in all things to the father hath by nature the same operation and authority in respect to all things but he saith that he can do nothing of himself but as he heareth so he judgeth in another way again showing himself equal in mind and power to god the father for neither will the father be conceived of as doing anything without the son alone and by himself 
seeing he hath him as his might and power therefore all things were made by him and without him was not made any one thing nor will the son again do aught of himself the father not co with him therefore he saith also of myself i do nothing but the father that dwelleth in me he doeth the works and we shall not suppose that the son is strengthened by the father as though weak and again that authority over all things is given him for then would he be no longer god by nature as having the glory of the godhead bestowed but neither would the father himself still exist in unimpaired excellency of good things if he had the word the impress of his nature such as to require power and authority from another for a giver of the things spoken of will be sought for analogously for the image and archetype and thus in short our argument will go forth into boundless controversy and will run out into the deep sea of blasphemy but since the son being of the essence of the father takes to himself by nature all the properties of him who begat him and essentially attains to one godhead with him by reason of identity of nature he is in the father and hath again the father in himself wherefore he frequently unblamed and truly attributes to the father the power of his own works not excluding himself from the power of doing them but attributing all things to the operation of the one godhead for one is the godhead in the father the son and the holy ghost and that the son is not inferior to the father either in power or operation unto aught but is like in all things and of equal might has been demonstrated by us elsewhere on the words the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do for what things soever he doeth these doeth the son too likewise but since i think it just and becoming to display the most devoted zeal in divine doctrines come let us after the custom of sailors on the sea wind back anew as a cable the whole argument of the chapter for in this way one may see that the son does not accuse his own nature by saying that he can do nothing of himself but rather exposes the folly of the jews and plainly shows that they trample on the law of moses for in that to the words i can do nothing of myself is immediately subjoined as i hear i judge it frees the son from all reproach of not being able to act of his own power rather it shows clearly that he is in all things filial and consentient with him who begat him for if as though impotent he were borrowing his power of the father as not having sufficient of himself how ought he not rather to say i can of mine own self do nothing i receive the power of my father but now as he does not say this but rather adds to the being able to do nothing of himself that he so judges as he hears it is evident that not in respect of weakness of operation as to aught does he put that he cannot but by reason of impossibility of transgressing in anything the will of the father for since one godhead is conceived of in the father and the son the will too i suppose will be surely the same and neither in the father nor yet in the son or the holy ghost will the divine nature be conceived of as at variance with itself but whatsoever seemeth good to the father for example this is the will of the whole godhead needs therefore does the son introduce himself as co-approving and consenting to the father in whatever seemeth good to him explaining that he cannot do anything which is not altogether according to the mind of the father for this is the meaning of of myself just as if he should say that he cannot commit sin he would not rightly seem to any to incur the charge of weakness but rather to set forth a wondrous and god-befitting property of his own nature for he gives to understand that he is immovable and unchangeable 
so when he acknowledges that he can do nothing of himself we shall rather be awestruck as seeing unchangeableness the fruit of the unchangeable nature than unseasonably account the not being able to be a mark of weakness let these things be said by us conformably to our own ability and let the lover of learning search out for better but we will not shrink from interpreting the saying in another way too lowering our manner of speech a little from the bounds of the godhead and the excellence of the only begotten and since the son truly was and was called man translating the force of the passage to the economy with flesh and showing that what follows is akin and connected with what preceded therefore he clearly testified that all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and that they shall come forth to be judged when he has once begun on the subject of his judging the world he not only promises to be a righteous judge at that time in which he says the resurrection of the dead will take place but also declares that even now he judges rightly and justly of matters in this life what was the question and of what the discourse here for our sakes he was born of a woman for as paul saith he taketh not hold of angels but of the seed of abraham wherefore it behoved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren but since he was made man and in servant's form he the lawgiver as god and lord is made under the law also he speaks then sometimes as under the law sometimes again as above the law and hath undisputed authority for both but he is discoursing now with the jews as lawkeeper and man is not able to transgress the commands ordered from above nor venturing to do aught of his own mind which does not agree with the divine law wherefore he says i can of mine own self do nothing as i hear i judge by testifying to himself that he can do nothing of himself which is not wholly in accordance with the law and that he judges and gives sentence in matters according as he hears to it by declaration of the law he exposes the unbelief of the jews and lays bare their headstrong habit for this too the words i can of mine own self do nothing well hint at as contrasting with ye recklessly transgress the commandments given you ye were bold to do all things of yourselves fearlessly and in every matter are ye zealous to give judgments not consonant to the divine decrees for ye teach for doctrines the commandments of men and make your own will a law what then is the aim of this way of speaking or how he introduces himself as judging justly and they not shall be told next he had healed the paralytic on the sabbath day he compassionated a man who had spent long time in sickness showing forth right and good judgment upon him for it was right to pity the sick man even on the sabbath day and by no means to shut up his compassion from reverence for the sabbath day practising a most vain piety as the father too works even on the sabbath day in regard of his economy towards his creatures and that surely through the son so doth himself also for neither did he think that a man who needed compassion on the sabbath day ought to be deprived of it by reason of the sabbath since he knew that the son of man was lord of the sabbath for not man was made for the sabbath but the sabbath for man therefore righteous herein and good is the judgment of the saviour not restraining by reason of the sabbath his loving-kindness to the prostrate but that which is god he knows how to perform for the divine nature is the fountain of goodness this he did even on the sabbath day but the judgment of the jews upon him in that they were vexed on account of the sabbath and therefore desired to kill him who had done them no wrong how is not this exceedingly dissonant to the divine laws for it is written the innocent and righteous slay thou not 
and the invention rather of their cruelty and not of the holy scriptures understand then that jesus says with a kind of emphasis to those who were angry at his deeds of good and found fault with his holy judgments following only their own imaginations and so to speak defining as law that which seemed to them to be right even though it be contrary to the law i can of mine own self do nothing that is to say i do all things according to the law set forth by moses i endure not to do anything of myself as i hear i judge for what willeth the law ye shall not respect persons in judgment for the judgment is god's why then saith he are ye angry at me because i have made a man every whit whole on the sabbath day and condemn not moses who decreed that children should be circumcised even on the sabbath judge not according to the appearance but judge righteous judgment if a man on the sabbath day receive circumcision that the law of moses should not be broken thus without due cause are ye vexed at seeing a man every whit healed on the sabbath day i therefore judged justly but ye by no means so for ye do all things of yourselves but i can of mine own self do nothing as i hear i judge and my judgment is just because i seek not mine own will as ye do but the will of the father which sent me what manner of sending this is and the mode of the being sent we have before spoken of at length and will refrain from speaking any more thereof but we must observe for profit's sake that he says that the law is the will of god the father thirty one thirty two if i bear witness of myself my witness is not true there is another that beareth witness of me and i know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true the most wise solomon gathering together the things in which a man may very reasonably glory and show his manner of life to be enviable and placing them before those who are apt to learn says the righteous man is his own accuser in the opening of the trial and again let thy neighbour praise thee and not thine own mouth a stranger and not thine own lips for a thing truly burdensome and most intolerable to the hearers is that some like not to be praised by the voice of others but attest unrestrainedly their own most noble and excellent deeds but with reason is such language distrusted for we are wont to be invited by certain so to speak natural and necessary drawings of self-love readily to ascribe to ourselves naught that is ill but ever to put about us and not altogether truthfully the things whereby any may be thought well behaved and good when then our lord jesus christ adjudged to himself that he judgeth righteous judgments saying openly that he could do nothing of himself but that he makes the will of the father his rule in all his actions and in saying this introduced himself as witness to himself although it was true yet of necessity considering the sophistry of the pharisees and what they would say in their folly for they knew not that he is god by nature he anticipates them in putting it forward and says ye following the practice of the common people and not advancing beyond surmise befitting jews will surely say thou bearest record of thyself thy record is not true but ye shall hear this in reply saith he i endure yet with your blasphemies i am by no means exceeding angry with you belching forth your words from the ignorance most dear to you i grant you for argument's sake that even this hath been well said by you be it so ye reject my voice there is another that beareth witness of me he here indicates god the father which is in heaven who hath now in divers manners attested the verity of the essence of his own son 
and he says that he knows that his witness is true showing that his own judgment too is in fact most trustworthy and true for lest by admitting as it were that he said things untrue of himself he should give room for malice and a loophole against himself to them who are accustomed to think otherwise he having ceded of necessity to what is becoming and customary that one ought not altogether to credit as true him who praises and approves himself returns again as god to his due position and says that he knows that the witness of the father is true all but teaching this i being very god know myself says he and the father will say nothing of favour concerning me for i am such by nature as he being true will declare me in the former part then there was an assent so to say of condescension and the words hypothetic rather than true in his saying that he knows that the witness of the father is true is the demonstration of god befitting credibility but it must be observed that in respect of his own person the father is other than the son and is not as some uninstructed heretics have imagined introduced as the son father thirty three ye have sent unto john and he hath borne witness unto the truth as we have just affirmed that it is disgraceful and not without share of the uttermost folly that any one should be seen as an admirer of his own excellencies even though he should by reason of exceeding virtue escape untruth so it is an absurdity cognate so to say and akin to this that any not called upon to bear witness to anything should of their own accord appear before the judges or those who wish to inquire for such an one would seem and that justly not altogether to be anxious to tell the truth but rather to be over-eager to give his testimony to make known not what the nature of the fact is but rather his own account of it most skilfully then yea rather as god doth our lord jesus christ overturning beforehand the charges of the pharisees in regard to this say ye have sent unto john not of his own accord says he does the baptist come to give his testimony to me he is clear from any charge of this he gave free testimony ye sent to ask john and he hath borne witness unto the truth for when he was asked by them who were sent to him whether he were the christ he confessed and denied not but confessed i am not the christ but am sent before him he hath then borne witness to the truth for christ is the truth thirty four but i receive not testimony from man but these things i say that ye might be saved he doth not reject the word of john as useless nor declare the witness of the truth to be of none effect for he would with justice have seemed to have wrought absurdity against himself by unreasonably dismissing from credence him whom he sent to cry prepare ye the way of the lord make straight the paths of our god but as striving with the unbounded disobedience of the jews he proceeds to what is better and of more weight saying that not of necessity is testimony to himself from voice of man admitted but rather giving them more glorious proof from the authority befitting him who is by nature god and from the excellence of the divine miracles for a person will sometimes reject the voice of man as not true even though he be happily enrolled among the saints which some not scrupling to do used to oppose the words of the prophets crying out speak unto us other things and declare unto us another deceit and yet beside these certain of them of jerusalem or of the land of judah who had escaped into egypt to wit azariah the son of hoshaya and johanan the son of korea and all the proud men as it is written openly disbelieving the prophecies of jeremiah said 
thou speakest falsely the lord sent thee not to say to us go not into egypt but demonstration through miracles what gainsaying will it admit of and the being borne witness to by the excellencies of god the father what mode of stubbornness will it yet grant to the fault-finders and verily nicodemus he was one of their rulers and ranked among those in authority gave incontrovertible testimony from his miracles saying rabbi we know that thou art a teacher come from god for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except god be with him sent then to disbelieve even the holy baptist himself who brought testimony as far as words go was not too much for the malice of the jews he says again in a sort of irony the blessed baptist hath borne witness to the truth even though questioned by you but since nothing has been left untried by you and ye have foolhardily accustomed yourself to launch forth into all manner of reviling ye have it is likely rejected his voice and since this too seems to you to be right be it so i am happily persuaded i agree with you i will put aside for your sakes the voice of john too and with you except against his testimony i have the father from above bearing testimony but teaching again that the expression implies assent for argument's sake he profitably subjoined but these things i say that ye might be saved that is i used this manner of speech to you not that the truth is so but for argument's sake that by every means ye may be saved and here our second book shall end end of chapter nine end of commentary on the gospel of john book two by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey